Um, and our next speaker in, in this session is uh, Dr. William Bobian Solny. He will talk about perioperative role of ultrasound, of renal ultrasound. Uh, I'm looking forward for your presentation. Greetings, everyone. My name is William Bobian Sweeney. I'm a nephrologist from Montreal. And today I've been invited to speak about the perioperative role of renal ultrasound. Thank you for the invitation to participate to this symposium. Here is our disclosures. So the objective of this talk is to uh, describe the normal anatomy of the kidney and its uh, appearance on 2D ultrasound, and also describe the normal appearance of Doppler uh, renal ultrasound. And then to identify abnormal findings and their uh, significance in a perioperative setting. Why would you want to perform renal ultrasound in the perioperative settings? Well, first, if it's an urgent surgery and the patient has kidney failure, you may want to uh, do a differential diagnosis before the surgery starts. After that, in the perioperative setting, the patient may develop oliguria and anuria, uh, and uh, this uh, requires some differential diagnosis at the bedside. After there is the opportunity to optimize kidney perfusion, and also anticipate acute kidney injury in the postoperative period. So let's go on and move to the assessment and the normal anatomy of the kidney. So the kidney is an intra-abdominal organ. You can see the basic anatomy here. This is a longitudinal view of the kidney. So you see that it is usually closed by the liver on the right side and the spleen on the left side. And you see that the first layer here, which is the renal cortex, is usually epo or isoechogenic to the, uh, to the liver on the side. The second layer, the medulla, contains the uh, renal pyramids, which are usually hypoechogenic uh, compared to the cortex. And after that, in the center of the kidney, there is the renal sinus, and it is more echogenic because of the fat. But uh, you see that uh, usually there is, we don't see the collecting structure because they are empty in normal setting. On surface ultrasound, the best way to assess the kidney and the most simple in the patient that is lying down is to go by the side up, uh, about uh, the mid axillary line. And when you approach the kidney that way, make sure to, uh, that uh, sometimes you, you must rotate the probe a little bit to obtain the full longitudinal view of the kidney since the kidney is often uh, at, a, at a, an angle on, in the abdomen. Now using TEE, the result, you can also usually see the left kidney using a transgastric approach as shown in the screen. Success is about 60% in adults, but uh, papers in the pediatric literature reports a higher success rate using TEE. And you obtain a view uh, which is shown in the screen and you can identify the normal structure on 2D ultrasound. Now, when you turn on color Doppler, you can identify the normal vasculature of the kidney. And you can usually, when the signal is, uh, is good, you can usually identify both the segmental, the interlobar arteries, and the interlobular arteries. So the interlobar arteries and veins are usually uh, between each of the pyramids of the medulla. When you uh, move the, your sample volume over this area and you activate pulse wave Doppler, you will usually obtain a waveform that looks like this. So on surface ultrasound on the left and on TEE on the right. And you see that the upper part of the screen uh, of the baseline on, uh, on the left is an arterial waveform with sh a sharp up, uh, systolic upstroke. And on the bottom of the screen, you see um, the venous uh, Doppler that is usually seen on the same, in the same image because the artery and the veins are usually close by. And uh, the, the, the best uh, described uh, indices to uh, measure on the arterial uh, waveform is the renal resistive index. And it is usually the maximal velocity minus the minimal velocity divided by the maximal velocity during the cardiac cycle. And the normal resistive index is usually lower than 0.7 uh, in the normal population. 
Now let's move on to abnormal findings. So the first thing that you will want to rule out in a patient that is uh, anuric or reduced uh, urinary output or in kidney failure of a non-cause is to uh, determine if there is a uh, urinary obstruction. Of course, even if the, if the uh, foley catheter is inserted, it's quite possible that the obstruction is uh, on the upper part of the urinary uh, system. So here on the screen, you see a normal kidney and you see that uh, in the middle, in the renal sinus, it is uh, bright, echogenic, without any uh, collecting structure seen. And then as hydronephrosis develops, you see that the collecting structure becomes dilated. This is mild hydronephrosis, moderate hydronephrosis with uh, the major calyxes being dilated, and then severe hydronephrosis with ballooning of the minor calyxes. Now, when hydronephrosis is chronic and prolonged, you see that, uh, you see that the uh, collecting structures are dilated, but also that the uh, cortex is, uh, is very thin. So there is atrophy of the renal parenchyma due, due to chronic hydronephrosis. And this is something of, uh, you can see that as, a, as a unexpected findings in patients with uh, minimal urinary symptoms presenting with kidney failure. Now, there is some uh, renal condition at, into the ultrasound that uh, mimics hydronephrosis. So here on the left, you have an example of medullary cyst. So me medullary cysts are not that common. The, it's cortical cysts that are most common in the kidney. But here you see that medullary cysts could uh, mimic hydronephrosis. But you see that the main difference is that those uh, cavities does not join together in the center of the kidney. On the right side of the screen, you see some uh, preeminent uh, renal pyramids. And this can be seen sometimes and, uh, and can mimic hydronephrosis. But as you can see, uh, as in the case of um, medullary cyst, you see that this uh, structure does not, does not join in the middle. So on the right image, in fact, this is a condition called uh, nephrocalcinosis, where uh, the pyramids get calcified with, uh, with chronic disease. There is also uh, settings where, uh, all, uh, ex uh, especially when uh, uh, kidney Doppler is difficult, that you can miss hydronephrosis. So this is a patient that had hydronephrosis, but because of the bad quality of the ultrasound exam, it could have been missed. And in fact, this, is, this was clinically significant because this patient had set sepsis on a, on a urinary infection with an obstructed kidney due to a stone. So you can also note the, the echogenicity of the kidney as uh, shown in the normal image here on, on the left. You see that the, the cortex is uh, in the parenchyma in general is uh, usually uh, uh, of a lesser dense uh, echogenicity than the, than the liver. But you see that uh, the kidney can be hyperechogenic in abnormal image. So in the center, this is a case of uh, acute kidney injury due to acute tubular necrosis. And after a few days, the kidney can become hyperechogenic, like shown in the screen. And on the right side, you see a case of chronic kidney disease, a patient on a dialysis. And you see that in this case, the kidney is atrophic and is hyperechogenic, but blends with the fat in the abdomen. So it's very difficult to see. So among abnormal findings that you can uh, find on uh, renal ultrasound, there is uh, some, uh, the most common are cortical cysts. So you see here on the left side of the screen, a simple cyst with an endechoic uh, image, uh, but it is uh, pretty large. And on the right side of the screen, you see uh, a mass on the, on the upper part of the, of the ultrasound image. And you see that compared to a simple cyst, this is a complex structure with eternal echoes. This is, uh, in fact, a malignant tumor, so that you could see. Be careful when reporting your ultrasound exam. The exam that you will do will likely not be uh, to uh, detect any abnormal mass. So be sure when you report to exam not to, uh, to write that you didn't see any abnormal mass, because you will likely not do a complete exam with a complete scanning of the kidney and some mass go, uh, may go unnoticed on the point of care ultrasound exam. 
Now let's move to abnormalities that you can see on uh, Doppler ultrasound of the kidney. So as I've shown you before, uh, here is a normal uh, color Doppler of the kidney. So um, some authors have proposed a semi-quantitative scale to identify if the kidney uh, is well perfused. So as you can see here, grade three means that uh, you can see uh, vessels in the entire field of view when you perform kidney ultrasound. But here with the decreasing grade, you see that uh, it is uh, more difficult to see the vessels. Here on grade two, you see vessels in the interlobar lobar vessels, but uh, not beyond. And then here grade one, you only see vessels in the vin vin vicinity of the ilum. And then grade four, you, uh, don't, you can't see any vessels on color Doppler. Now, it will be great if this simple uh, measurement could uh, predict the occurrence of acute kidney injury, but that, that, but that, that so far is not uh, yet uh, too convincing. This is the, the biggest study and uh, studying this uh, semi-quantitative scale of color Doppler. Uh, this is a study made in uh, the setting of uh, critical care with uh, a population that uh, had a good proportion of uh, patients with uh, sepsis. And you see that uh, the semi-quantitative scale adds some uh, capacity to identify the occurrence of acute kidney injury, but it was um, uh, a very low discrimination, a uh, little bit better than chance, but not by much, and uh, not superior to the clinician's uh, prediction of uh, acute kidney injury. But uh, it must be understood that um, acute kidney injury is not uh, only due to uh, low perfusion. And the fact that a lot of patients in this cohort had sepsis may have reduced the ability to detect AKI because uh, some patients had, may have had normal kidney blood flow, but uh, may have developed acute kidney injury nonetheless. Now, this may be different in the context of cardiac surgery, although there is no uh, definitive study on the subject. Here is an example from uh, Dr. André Deneau on a case uh, obtained uh, using TEE during cardiac surgery with circulatory arrest. So you see here during circulatory arrest, there is no, uh, there's no signs of perfusion on, on color Doppler. And then as uh, the, the uh, mean arterial pressure increase, there is some color Doppler uh, returning to the kidney here. This is as a, as a, in, a, in a map of 60, here a map of 70, here a map of 85, and here again a map of 60. But as you can see, uh, even if the <clears throat> map is lower than in the previous image, the color Doppler is uh, greater than uh, immediately be after um, circulatory arrest. So there, this may offer insight, uh, insight uh, about uh, how the kidney is reperfused after intraoperative events such as circulatory arrest. Here is the reminder of how the uh, kidney doppler was at the uh, at mean arterial pressure of 60 just after uh, the exit of uh, circulatory arrest. So uh, moving on now to the renal resistive index. So we call it the renal resistive index, but it's in fact a misnomer because it's not only measuring a renal resistance, renal vascular resistance, but a variety of factors can influence this, this marker. So if you, we have here our arterial tree, you see that the renal resistive index will be measured in the medium-sized artery here. Everything uh, affecting downstream resistance or impedance can affect the renal resistive index. So this can be vascular resistant, but, but it can also be extrinsic compression, for example, in abdominal compartment syndromes. And also ven high venous pressure can also affect the renal resistive index. But also all the upstream factors influencing pulse pressure can affect the Doppler waveform, the arterial Doppler wave waveform in the kidney. So uh, valve, aortic valve function, heart rate, stroke volume, age, vascular compliance, and also any obstruction, for example, renal artery stenosis, will also modify the arterial uh, upper waveform and will influence the resistive index. 
So here is an example of how our tick valve disease can influence the, uh, the renal resistive index and the overall uh, shape of the, of the uh, kidney Doppler. So you see here before our tick valve replacement, we have the systolic upstroke in the arterial waveform is uh, of uh, lower velocity here. The acceleration is more, uh, is more sluggish. And then after our, our tick valve replacement, you see that the uh, systolic upstroke is not brisk. So this is just an example on how it can affect. And here in the bottom of the screen, you can also uh, see uh, the effect of an interoptic uh, uh, balloon pump on the arterial uh, Doppler. So as I previously said, any obstruction in the, in the renal artery can affect, also affect the arterial Doppler waveform. So this is a case where uh, uh, aortic prosthesis was being installed for a, a type two uh, aortic dissection. And uh, as you can see on the, uh, on the left side of the screen, this is the right renal artery uh, waveform here with a high resistive index, probably because of the baseline characteristics of the patients. But on the uh, right side of the screen, there is the um, kidney Doppler waveform for the left renal artery. And this artery, in this case, was being partially obstructed by the aortic pr prosthesis. And that's why the, uh, the renal uh, artery waveform was being blunted. And that's why the renal resistive index was actually lower than on the contralateral side. Intraoperative monitoring may also have some other applications. For example, here is a case where uh, at the start of the surgery, the renal resistive index was uh, almost normal at uh, 0.7 here. But during the case, there was uh, multiple um, air emboli that were dete detected on transcranial Doppler, but also uh, on, uh, on uh, the Doppler of the kidney here, some upper intensity signals. And then after the case, after uh, the, the CBP, there was, as you can see, an increase in the renal resistive index compared to the preoperative one at 0.85. And this patient went on to develop acute kidney injury in the postoperative period. So overall, even if the renal resistive index is, uh, is a marker that is influenced by many factors, in general, the high resistive index is predictive of acute kidney injury in the post-operative period. This has been shown in multiple studies, in, especially in cardiac surgery. In patients with, for example, sepsis, it is less well recognized for, uh, for reasons I uh, previously mentioned. And this is our local data that, uh, that come from uh, uh, 145 cardiac surgery patients. You see that it has a moderate discrimination in predicting the occurrence of acute kidney injury. This is when, uh, this is when assessed uh, right uh, at the admission to the ICU after cardiac surgery. So in theory, uh, if you uh, assess the renal resistive index and do uh, an intervention, so for example, a passive leg raise or a change in vasopressor, the change in the renal resistive index may be a proportional to the kidney blood flow. Although, as I said, many factors can influence it, including post pressure. So that may change with vasopressor support. We did a small study in uh, after cardiac surgery uh, where we performed a uh, passive leg raise in, uh, in cardiac surgery patients that were also at the pulmonary artery catheter where we can measure uh, cardiac output. And in fact, the change in uh, renal resistive index during the passive leg raise was uh, uh, quite predictive of the change in uh, in cardiac output uh, resulting from the passive leg raise. So uh, preliminary results, but are interesting because uh, repeated assessment of the renal resistive index could in theory uh, be used to determine uh, the change in uh, renal blood flow, especially in cardiac surgery patients. Now let's switch to uh, venous Doppler. So what are the principles of venous Doppler? Well, the venous circulation is usually pretty compliant. So um, as we go uh, backward in the venous circulation, usually the, the variation in the pressure in the right atria are not transmitted deep in the venous circulation. So for example, the portal vein would be monophasic without much uh, variation in, uh, during the cardiac cycle. And the same thing for the venous flow in the kidney. So as 
uh, Venus compliance drop if uh, the Venus system gets distended. Those variation in pressure in the right atria gets transmitted in the periphery. And then uh, renal, uh, there is venous pulsatility that can be detected in the kidney and elsewhere in the body. So in the kidney, you see the normal uh, Doppler waveform in the, in the bottom of the screen. So you see in the, during the cardiac cycle, it is, it is continuous during the cardiac cycle, but as the venous compliance drop, it will become pulsatile with short interruptions and it can become pulsatile with prolonged interruption and the flow restricted to diastole as uh, the severity of venous congestion increased. So this is a case uh, took during cardiac surgery. You see that in the beginning of the case, it is monophasic. And then during, during uh, off-pump cardiac surgery, there was a right ventricular failure developed and it become pulsatile. And then with uh, uh, interventions such as inhaled um, uh, vasodilators, you see that there is a uh, resolving of the, of the pulsatility here. So we uh, studied the phenomenon in cardiac surgery patients. And as you can see, it is very rare to see abnormal kidney venous Doppler in the preoperative period, but a significant proportion of patients will develop some alterations in uh, intrarenal venous flow in the postoperative period. And uh, on the right side of the screen, you see that if it is detected on admission to the ICU, there is an increased risk of acute kidney injury in the patient that have uh, alt alteration in intravenous, uh, intravenous Doppler. So as conclusion of this uh, presentation, you see that um, there is there can be several applications of perioperative kidney ultrasound. Some are more, uh, more at the research stage, some are well established, but I think it is uh, worthwhile in certain settings to uh, do kidney, ultra, kidney ultrasound if you can. So kidney ultrasound can be used to identify obstruction in the pre or post operative setting. It also can be used to moderately anticipate the development of acute kidney injury, but especially it can be used to gain insight into the hemodynamic factor affecting kidney function and kidney perfusion, and could be used to individualize uh, management in the perioperative period. So thank you so much for your attention. I want to thank uh, all the people that are funding my research activities. And I want to thank the, the organizers of the symposium for inviting me. If you have any questions, please reach out to my email address on screen. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for fascinating lectures from Dr. Bobian Solini. Uh, I understand that Dr. Bobian Solini won't be able to answer all questions, but uh, I believe um, Andrea will be able to answer some of them.